Good morning, everyone. When I was a boy, I studied the trumpet. I had a wonderful trumpet teacher, and uh, he taught me many things. But one thing he never said to me was, Roger, if you practice every day, and you study your scales and your arpeggios, if you warm up carefully, if you practice your long tones, someday you might be invited to speak at HR.com's lead. <laughs> yeah. So I need to explain a little bit about why it is that a symphony orchestra conductor stands in front of you here. During the first part of my career, really all that I did was conduct concerts and rehearsals. I was just the conductor. But I was very conscious about the fact that in the classical music field, we had an audience problem. And there were many people who were very intelligent, well-educated, curious people who, for some reason, felt alien in the concert hall. And I set it about myself, I set it as a goal to see whether I could impact those people. And the big elephant in the room in the classical music field was that a lot of people just resist it. They have a resistance to it. So I wanted to think about, was it possible to create a circumstance uh, in which people could have the kind of experience that made me fall in love with music? So my strategy was to, let's see if we can get this clicker to work. Yeah, to put people inside the orchestra where I fell in love with music. And here are civil servants from the Dutch government seated amongst the great residency orchestra. And you can see them all sprinkled about. And there I would present music as a kind of a metaphor. And my big revelation was that when you, music is presented metaphorically, it actually sounds more beautiful because of that. And then the, the metaphor had a kind of a magical effect. And that was that it revealed something which was so basic and so true that it unlocked a kind of a natural behavior in people and allowed them to see themselves much more clearly. A lot of time to see things about themselves that they didn't really want to acknowledge and would not have acknowledged were it not for the metaphor. And when I started doing this in front of business organizations, what I discovered was there was another elephant in the room, in that room, that I had no idea about. And that is that workforces naturally resist their leadership. That when people are successful, they don't like being told how to be more successful. And so I'm going to show you a couple of clips now uh, from actual sessions uh, in the music paradigm. And in every session, I go to the corner of the room, like I might go and pick one of these three ladies at this table here, and take one of them and bring them up to stand here, and go to the other corner and bring somebody up here. And that's what you're going to see now. I'm going to need you, so just follow me. <laughs> Can we adjust the lights? You have nothing to worry about. Just take, come up onto the podium, and I'll get you a companion. So, the moment you're up here, it's quite a sight, isn't it? Yeah. Very different from the sight that you had from your chair. And immediately you can see that some people, mostly these people here, are really lucky because they're so close to the woodwinds, the brass, everybody hears. Uh, the strings are not far away. It's just very information rich here. Whereas if you look at your chair and your chair, you could see it was one of the worst in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's why I chose you, 
because it's not only in this room is that way, organizations have that as well. There are certain offices that are close to where decisions are being made. They feel like they, they know what's been decided. They know what the state of the whole organization is. They can see the big picture. And then there are people who feel like they're the last ones to know what's going on. And so I've taken you from those offices and brought you here to the, the nerve center of this orchestra. And your job is simply to listen from here and then tell your colleagues what's it like here. So let's play the same passage once again. Okay, so Linda, you heard those notes before. You heard them from your chair. You heard a couple of new ones that you haven't heard. What's your report? And hold the mic real close. Okay, it's a totally different experience. Sitting back there, really all I could hear were the double basses. And so now, standing here, you hear each group, sort of, they each take a turn of singing out, but then you can hear the whole um, orchestra together. And it's what, What's the effect of that, of hearing each group sing out? Um, well, it's, I mean, it, it sort of my attention kept turning from one group to another as they each kind of took their, uh, took their space in the limelight. Uh, more interesting for your Much mind? more interesting. Uh -huh. More exciting? Yes, much more exciting. Okay. I'll hand, put my chair here next time. <laughs> <laughs> hand the mic to Steve. And uh, uh, talk about the, well, talk about whatever impressed you. Uh, for me, uh, the, the, the comparison with sitting at the back and coming to the front was that I got a much greater sense of the personality of the orchestra and I felt included in that personality and I would link that to a culture in an organisation and being part of that culture. So, so was, you, you felt the culture from here yes. of the organisation and from there? And, and from there I felt more on the periphery so the sound was reverberating in a different way for me. Yeah. And this is the reason that enterprise perspective is so difficult in any organization. Here, you get the enterprise perspective. I mean, that's what this is for, this podium. But we know that orchestras aren't the only organizations that have a podium. Any organization that requires coordinated action has a podium. And isn't it true that with respect to the people who take direction from you, you are on the podium and they are in the chairs. That means that you see a bigger perspective than they do and they are caught up in their locality. The things that are around them that they do every day is what focuses their attention. And if you're the leader and you're trying to, them to, to give them an enterprise perspective, you can see that it's no small task because the very nature of large organizations makes it difficult for people in the chairs to see that. Uh, and so the conductor learns that part of your job is to somehow, with what you do, communicate the whole, pers the whole perspective and to make people understand how they fit into that and thereby give meaning to their work. So I think it's universal in large organizations that estrangement is a reality. And it's actually a reality in orchestras as well. And the really experienced conductors are the ones who know how to align everybody, bring people inside of a kind of a vision of success, and show them how their part, what part they play in that. Uh, but I find, my experience is that leaders 
you know, very successful leaders, they default into a kind of behavior which is expert problem solving. They solve one problem, they solve another, they solve them very successfully without realizing that they're leaving a kind of a leadership vacuum because they haven't really given much attention to what the success picture that everybody could align around would be. So the next, the next video is going to show you one exercise that is designed for that. And maybe while the video is playing, if you could bring me a microphone on a stand, and I'll use that after the video. Thank you. So let's look at the next one. All the principal players in this run through are going to be very dedicated to this performance. But all the rank and file are going to do as little as possible without getting caught. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That means that yeah. you look good. If any of the people are looking at you, you look really good. But between you and your instrument, you know it is coast until retirement mentality. Okay. What would this passage sound like at the opening? I see the surprised expressions on your faces. I think to a person, everybody is thinking, that's fine. <laughs> right? Isn't that what you were thinking? I'm trying to hear the dysfunction. I don't hear it. But think of it. Why should that surprise you? We all know that's the way the vast majority of organizations in the world work. We all know that. And the people who take accountability and responsibility are so good that they carry it for everyone else. And you wouldn't even think it was a dysfunction until you heard the following. What would this sound like if every musician in the orchestra used everything you know, all those decades of practicing, and all that professional experience, and the greatest chamber music coaches, and all those things you discovered in practicing that maybe nobody in the world knows that you know, and it's key to your playing, but it's special. What if you use it all to make this orchestra sound the way these people never imagined a symphony orchestra could sound? What would that be like? And it's right for you to applaud spontaneously, because the leader who thinks his or her job is simply, if something goes wrong, I fix it, will never elicit that kind of response. It's only the leader who knows what the possibility could be and sees the difference between that possibility and what the workforce is doing that will draw that kind of energy and delight the customer in that way. Okay, so, by the way, none of these things are scripted. 
Everything is completely spontaneous. The orchestra has no idea what's going to be asked of them. But I wanted to ask you, so how, how does this video, how does it resonate for this audience? of HR people, all concerned about leadership. And that last, that last thing on the video, we saw the two, the violinists, same violinists working in different ways. How would you translate that into the language that everybody here speaks? I mean, I think that we have a, um, an opportunity to help influence people in the organization, to be leaders that inspire others, so that we can leverage the skills all the skills of everyone in our organization and really see the true value that we can all bring. And when you look at the violinists on the left, the coast until retirement violinist, right? Uh, does that actually really exist in organizations? No. <laughs> I thought so. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. So the next, the next clip you're going to see is, it's about leaders who move from being individual contributors, which they do so well that naturally they get promoted to leadership positions. But in the leadership positions, often they use the same skill set that made them successful as individual contributors. And a lot of times, as leaders, that doesn't work at all. So this is a, a scientific uh, organization. And I was told that these leaders in the research and development department uh, use the same skills that made them successful as scientists. And one of them is the need for absolute accuracy in what they do. So as leaders, they sit on decisions until they have the same degree of certainty that they would need in the lab. And meanwhile, their people are just languishing, waiting for them to, uh, to act as leaders. Now, if you tell people that they're behaving that way, that's only going to invite an enormous amount of resistance and denial. But if I can model that myself, it creates the space in which they can see it. So I bring somebody from the audience up, like let's say you, sir, and I bring you up here and make you my witness. This is just an if, uh, a what if. Yes. And so I whisper to him what my intent is. And I say to him, setting the tempo in the, is very important. I've got to make sure I get exactly the right tempo. And that's what you'll see in this video. OK, so measure 66. That was the demonstration, okay? Now sit down for a moment and... <laughs> talk about that. Why did, he, why did the cellos play so badly? Because <laughs> you'll admit that, yes. that was pretty bad. It was it? bad. It took too long to start. What? You, you were making us doubt. We were uh, waiting on the point of starting, but there was no clear moment. Uh, we didn't know anymore. So wait a minute. First of all, did the section play well together? No, we didn't have the same tempo. Uh -huh. And you say that it was because? Well, because of you, you were communicating. <laughs> because of you, in fact. Yeah, sorry. But I know it was because of me. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you were so making sure, to be sure, that you seemed very unsure, in fact. <laughs> you, you were sort of preparing and doubting and, and doing the tempo inside your head that we didn't know anymore what you wanted to, to do, that, what you wanted us to do. How did it feel to be working with a leader like that? Very insecure. Uh -huh. Yeah, very uh, uncomfortable. You were not communicating to us, but to yourself, uh -huh. uh, inside your mind, and we were left alone. That's what, that was now, I want everybody to understand how uncomfortable. Did it affect you physically? Did it affect your body? Yes, because uh, I was at least 10 times ready to start and every time <laughs> holding, <laughs> holding back, in fact. Good. Thank you. So now, my witness, 
tell them what, what my intent was. So the strategy was uh, to make sure that he got it right. From the first, first, first moment, he had to get it right. So, so he was really concentrating on getting it right. Yes. So that was the strategy. I can't emphasize getting it right from the first moment enough. Right, exactly. So you can see that the right decision presented in the wrong way, in the wrong timing, is the wrong decision. So what I like about interviewing the orchestra in these situations is that my audience of executives all around get to hear what's being said about them behind their backs. And yet it's presented in a way that, that they don't resist because the metaphor shields them from direct contact with it. So you have a very pensive expression on your face. Yeah, so uh, talk about about this issue as, it, as you've seen it play out in your career. Well, I think you bring up Hold a, the mic a little oh, sorry. closer. I think yeah. you bring up a really good point, and that is subject matter experts, SMEs, they, they're rewarded for their behavior, and then when they get to be a manager, um, it's a whole new school skill set. But they were successful based on those subject matter expert, go-to expert, skill sets, um, and that's the true transition that I think HR folks have to help lead and navigate them through. Because they don't have that skill set to be able to, it's, it, it was perfect, they got them there. They don't have the skill set to say, wait a minute, is there something more? Yeah, so that's what I get from it. Yeah, you express it really beautifully. Yeah. And uh, of course the enemy in bringing about this change, in a way, it's the success that the individual contributor had in the previous posi position. And so what you need to do is to break that somehow, to put them in a situation that robs them of their success so that they can, so they can look at something freshly. But how do you do that without disturbing them? But you put them right in the middle of a symphony orchestra, nobody knows anything about it. They're all on a level playing field in addition to which, it's so far away from their workplace and those issues that it seems innocent enough. And therefore, with a, the, a properly designed metaphor, you can bring the issue right before them in a way that will give them a safe space to consider it. So the next, I don't mind mentioning the client for the next one, it was Chick-fil-A. And in front of me is an audience of 4,000 restaurant owners and these are people who work really hard and very dedicated, and they've built their restaurant. They're now enjoying a kind of success and expansion. And what's happening is that these people are burning out because they've always done everything. They've always been on top of everything, supervising everything, but it's gotten too big. It can't be handled by one person or one inner group. Leadership has to be delegated down, but there's a lot of resistance to that. So I designed this, this metaphorical exercise in which I begin by modeling a conductor who does exactly the same thing. He, he phrases every phrase. He looks at every detail. He, he shows everything to the orchestra. And in the beginning, you'll see me conducting in that dysfunctional way. this microphone to the principal flute, who didn't play a note, but certainly enjoyed that demonstration. <laughs> so talk about what it's like playing for the orchestra with this conductor. Well, um, it makes me feel as if I can't do my own thing. It makes me feel like as if everything I mean, you're micromanaging everything, essentially. So it, you're doing too much. And it's actually very distracting. 
um, because instead of thinking about the music, I'm seeing you trying to handle every single detail, which is a little... Well, can I argue with you for a moment? That don't you want a conductor who knows all the details of the whole operation and understands how it all fits together? There's a difference between knowing the details of the operation and um, there's a difference between knowing that and then trusting that that's going to happen. You don't have to necessarily stake your claim in every single aspect of the orchestra that's going on at one time. Well, suppose I said, I said, look, I'm really invested in this performance. I want it to be really great. I've worked really hard for this, and I know how all the parts fit together, and I'm just taking care that everything goes right. You're telling me that's, that's not going to work. Well, it's because you're trying too hard, it, it sort of chokes us in what we're able to do. Did you say it chokes the orchestra? Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's a very real feeling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And describe just exactly how nauseating it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're doing a demonstration now, so it, it you know, it, for us, it's, it's comedic, but, um, <laughs> but, but really, if, if, if we had a conductor that was like that, that every single time that we came to rehearsal was dictating every single thing that we were doing, we would, as artists, we would just feel completely demoralized because we wouldn't be able to um, say what we're supposed to say. Thank you very much. Pass the mic forward. Yeah. So let's talk about the flutist's speech just now, if you don't mind. Right, so how did that resonate with you, what, what she was saying? Well, it was hard to resonate because I'm sure I don't lead that way. Um, no, it, 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 it really struck home because um, I, we run a consulting firm and we reward those who are the best subject matter experts with promotions. And so you get these deep knowledge people that now are thrust into leadership and they now think that the key to leadership for them is let me show everyone I'm supervising how much I know and let me demonstrate that I can solve every problem that my team is now best with solving. And I think that probably is choking to the team members um, quite a bit. So how do the people in this room help that new leader? How, how do you get them off of that behavior and into something else? You've got to somehow convince people that when they get that promotion, when they are thrust into that leadership role for the first time, that they're really starting with a whole new skill set. And in a large part, what they thought they knew is kind of currency that's no longer valuable. It's Confederate money, if yeah. you will. So all that knowledge, just put it aside. It will help you. But you've got to start back in kindergarten again, developing a new set of skills. It would be as if you would say, you know what, Tom Brady just won the Super Bowl, let's make him the new coach. And that may or may not have any benefit. It's, yeah. it's not true, it's just another metaphor, but to us it seems obvious that Tom Brady shouldn't be the coach necessarily. But in business we do it all the time. Yeah. That's beautifully said, that. And so if I were that leader, I would say, I would say, uh, okay, that's fine, but you're telling me to go back to kindergarten. But I'm, I'm a leader. I don't want to feel like I'm in kindergarten. And give me a picture of what this leadership is like. Help me visualize it so that I can see. So the next video I'm going to show you is exactly that. And here's what I did. I modeled three dysfunctional conductors in sequence. The first one was kind of remote. The second one invested in discipline. The third one was a classic micromanager. And then in the fourth, I conducted the way I believe leadership should be. And then I put this video together in which you can see on one side of the screen the good leadership, on the, on the right side of the screen, on the left side, you see the dysfunctional leadership. And it's fascinating to look at. Here it is.
There's a lot to contemplate in that video. And what I, I think, when I look at it, what I see on the right is a leader who, while carrying out the operation for the organization, nonetheless, is showing what the work means at all times, and in a way that invites everybody to be part of it. It creates the space, everybody can understand what we're trying to accomplish, everybody can feel how they fit into it, and, and they see that it's something that they want to be part of. And all the dysfunctional conductors are concentrating on everything except the work. They're focusing on their relationship and leaving this vacuum. So I have one last little video to show you. I love this. Uh, after having modeled all these dysfunctional leaders, I thought it was really important for my audience of ex assembled executives to hear some musician talk about what successful leadership is like. So I hand the microphone to the concertmaster and I ask her that question. And what happens immediately is very surprising and also is food for thought for anybody who works in an organization. Here it is. You've seen a couple of really bad conductors now, right? Really bad ones. But talk just a little bit about working with a great conductor. Well, first of all, you have to know that you've answered uh, many of the musicians' prayers today by letting us tell a conductor exactly what we think of him. <laughs> Go on now. Okay. So, so for that, we thank you. Okay. Um, working with a great conductor takes being a musician from being a job to being a fulfillment of our highest values. It allows us to realize our art form in a way that's bigger and better and more profound than we can realize it on our own. Thank you. So two things I'd like you to contemplate as I leave you. One is, what was that demonstration that broke out just there with the orchestra and the executives all feeling like it was a party? Did you see that? The sudden unleashing of all that energy and it's pretty obvious how they all feel under the thumb of their boss and how imprisoned they feel, held back. Uh, and having the chance to speak the truth to power, that was what caused that. And that's part of what we have to deal with. Everybody who's trying to create a workforce that's more enlightened, more productive, uh, does more original work, more sustainable. Uh, and the other thing that I'd ask you to contemplate is how can you advocate the use of metaphor to communicate the really important messages, especially the sensitive ones? Because you can see that metaphor has a very special power. So thanks so much for looking at that and for listening to me today. <laughs>